Good. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Kaur, and yeah, my talk is about fatherhood. It's essentially uh, a, a lot of about the stories about me and how I fixed the relationship I had with my father about 15 years ago, and about that, how that really has transformed my life. And what I've realized perhaps in the last 15 years is I perhaps wasn't the only one who had a difficult relationship with my father. So I'm trying to talk about a, a broader area than that. Yeah, so a bit of context, um, I'm a, I, my career, my first part of my career I was a manager working in big organizations, which I did for 20 years, and now the last 15 years I've been a coach. There are some of the clients that I've worked for, and I've been lucky enough with some of the clients to travel around the world. So most of the work I've done has been in Europe, but I've also worked in America and in Asia. My family life, I'm married. I married a, a Dutch lady um, many years ago, and we've got two kids. Uh, we've lived in Holland for the last 20 years, um, and in a sense, when I lived in England, I lived there for 34 years, I didn't really understand what the English culture was like. It's a bit like a fish swimming in water. The fish doesn't really see the water until he comes out of it. So what I want to do in terms of the talk, I want to look at some different perspectives. I want to look at the perspective of the first period when I worked, when I was pretty much a workaholic, I worked extremely hard. I'm going to look at the angle of a father, a son, and a husband. I'm going to look at some facts about men and women. I'm going to talk about what I've seen as a leadership coach in the last 15 years or so. And then I want to end in terms of the future, and hopefully what will be a brighter future. So, that's basically the story, <laughs> the first part of my career. Um, I started after leaving university when I was about 22, um, and by the time I was 39, I'd had 13 bosses. I'd worked in all sorts of different positions in different companies. I worked for three different companies, and as you see, I was a little bit heavier by the end of my career than I was at the start of it. I used to start in the morning for a lot of that period. I would wake up thinking about work. Uh, it was the first thing in my mind. And off it, I would go to my work, I was pretty determined, so I'd work hard. And then I would sort of be working in a situation in a lot of big organizations where people seem to be working in divisions or silos. They're not really working together. That's how I certainly experienced it. And it was a sense, it was a bit like rather than all of us going forward together into the future all linked up, it was more like sort of walking in treacle or syrup. It was very hard to get anything done with the processes and the egos and the things that were going on in these big organizations. I'd come home at the end of the day and uh, yeah, once or twice a week, it was certainly not my intention, but I would come home pretty much exhausted and within a few minutes of playing with my kids, um, either me or my daughter or my son would uh, get ratty. Uh, and then I think, well, how, how on earth did that happen? So that was very much a, a typical day. And if there's one image to pick up really a lot of the period of that time, it's this one, where I was, yeah, I felt sort of torn between working, getting things done, uh, and being at home with my family. And normally, it's the left side that was winning. Why was I doing that? I don't know if I was consciously doing it, but what happened as I was going through my career, very often there were reorganizations in the companies that I worked for. And people were getting laid off, uh, and of course what I was trying to do was get over the hurdles and make sure I kept my job. That's why I think why I was working so hard. Um, eventually, after God knows how many reorganizations, um, yeah, I was let go. I was fired from the company I'd worked for for 11 years. And that was a really tough period of my life. Um, I felt really rejected. And funny enough, I'd had almost exactly the same feeling about 20 years earlier. Why? Because when I was about eight, my mother died. Within a very short time, the wicked stepmother arrived. And when I was 13 years old, she said to my father, either he goes, meaning me, or she goes. And unfortunately, he made the wrong choice. Uh, and so I, I lived in my teenage years in children's homes. So you can imagine that was quite a difficult period in my life between 13 and 18. 
just before I got made redundant, there was a girl who worked for me, a Chinese girl, and she said to me, she could see I was really struggling. She said to me, she said she talked about a friend of hers who went to see a coach and therapist. And uh, I thought, oh, that's a good idea. So I went to my doctor. I told him a little bit about my background. Um, and he gave me a list of names of some potential therapists to see. He didn't really think I needed to see one, but he still gave me a list anyway. And I did. I went to the top of the list. I went to see a woman. And for the first time in my life, certainly for the last 20 years or so, after sitting with her for a couple of hours, I had a feeling of peace of mind. I felt, I don't know, I'd never had that feeling. I certainly hadn't had it because I was running around trying to keep my job in the manic world that I was in at that time. Just after I was made redundant, because I le lived in Holland and my Dutch wasn't very good, I, the, the old company paid for me to have Dutch lessons. So I was sitting with my Dutch teacher. Um, and of course, you sit there for two or three hours and you've got to find things to talk about. So I remember one day I was telling her about my daughter and my son. And I was saying how I come home from work pretty tired and my daughter particularly, she get really upset. And I was trying to explain to my Dutch teacher what was wrong with my daughter. And what she said to me, she said, what your daughter needs is your attention. And I knew even then that attention and love are very much one and the same thing. So at the end of the lesson, I drove home, I think it was about 70 kilometers to my house in Holland, and I cried all the way home because I realized, whoa, I'm doing to my kids exactly what my father had done to me. It had a big impact on me. Then I was with the coach, the therapist, and uh, we got onto the subject of my relationship with my dad. Um, and I said to her, yeah, we, <laughs> we don't really have a very good relationship. He lives in England, I live in Holland, but much more serious than that, yeah, we don't get on. Uh, we hadn't got on for years. And she said to me, she said, well, why don't you, now you've got some time on your hands, because I'd never really had time on my hands, I wasn't working. She said, why don't you go and see him and try and understand a little bit more about him and his life? Um, so I did. But before that, she said to me, she said something really unusual, I thought at the time. She said, what I'd like you to do, I'd like you to write a letter to your father. In fact, I'd like you to write two letters. I don't want you to post them. I just want you to write a letter to him. One about anger, about what he'd done to me and my sisters. And one about love, because he's my father. So I went home that evening. I went upstairs to my office. I got out some paper. And I started writing these letters. And all of a sudden, a huge series of emotions came out, which I think I had buried for maybe decades. So I wrote the letters. Then I went to see him. And luckily by this time, he had married uh, again. He would married a social worker, a very caring woman. And I went to see him. And I spent some time really, as I said, trying to understand him and his life, what was going on when I was a kid. And perhaps even more important, his childhood and what was shaping his view of the world at that time. What I learned was he went to Egypt for a year in the military service. He came home after a year. He walked into his house and his mother said to him, hey, it's our John. She didn't embrace him. She didn't say she'd missed him. She said in rather a cold way, hey, it's our John. And what I started to learn was that in his background, there was very little warmth in those days. I also learned that his father never really got involved with the children. His father was working in the factory seven, 12 hours a day, six days a week. So everything that happened with the children came through the mother, and that was the model that my father grew up with. So I started, for the first time in my life really, to perhaps more deeply understand why the, he behaved the way that he did, what was shaping his view, understanding him a, a lot more deeply. We exchanged some letters. He went with his new wife 
and they visited and read the reports about all of this stuff that had happened 30, 40 years ago in the children's homes, which were very, very critical of him. At this point, he was about 70 years old. We exchanged some letters, and I suppose what really happened was I understood him and then forgave him for the stuff that had happened to me and my kids, my sisters. And that was 15 years ago. If I had to say what's the relationship I've had with my father since then, I would say fantastic the last 15 years. We've had a magnificent relationship. I definitely use words like that. And the more I see him, the happier I am. And I'm sure it's the other way around as well. And after fixing this relationship, I felt, um, yeah, complete. I felt whole. And what I thought previous to this time, I'd always felt as though something was missing, as though I had to prove myself or I wasn't good enough or I had to do some great performance or I had to get promoted at work or I had to earn more money. But the last 15 years, hmm, sure, I like to do well, but I, don't, I feel completely different than I did in those times. So, a year or two later, I set up my own company, which I never would have done had I not sorted the relationship out with my father. And about a year after that, my sister, who lives in Australia, she sent me this book. And it's about manhood, it's about modern men. And it's an amazing book. And it talks in this book about how isolated and lonely men are and how they don't have connections like women do. We have mates. We don't so much have friends that we can talk about important things in our lives with. It also talked about some facts about men and women. So suicides, three out of four suicides are guys. <coughs> Nine out of 10 people in prison are guys. People we see on the streets of London, three out of four of them are men. Alcoholics, three out of four of them are men. And maybe the, the most hurtful bit on the slide for me is children. People who have trouble at school, behavioral problems, learning problems, four out of five of them are boys. This is, I find this terrible. This is not good news for our society. And maybe it's not just me who's got a hole inside of themselves. And what do we fill it with? Well, for me, it was beer. I used to fill that little hole once or twice a week by drinking beer. This doesn't help, of course. It doesn't sort out what the hole is. You can't get enough of what you don't need. Then there's a chapter in this book which thousands of men have written to the author about. And it's basically about relationships between fathers and sons. And what he says in the book is, if you ask a group of men to talk about the relationship with their fathers, first one is they don't like it. They feel a bit uncomfortable on this subject. But when you get them really talking about them, what you will find is three out of 10 men, they don't have a relationship with their father. I don't mean he's dead. I mean they don't, he's alive and they don't see him. Three out of ten do uh, better than that, but it's like cactusy, it's prickly. When they're together, somebody gets angry in a short period of time. Three out of ten that do much better than that, but it's more like duty. They spend time together for birthdays, they send cards to each other, they mow the lawn together, they go to football matches together. And only one out of ten will say, my father, he's an emotional anchor in my life. What a terrible statistic that is. But perhaps even more important in the book than that is, we can change this. And what he says in the book is, if we can find the opportunity to talk and set up a series of conversations with our dads about their background, their childhood, and understand them in a deeper way, we can change where we are on that spectrum. We can shift it. What he also says is that in our memory banks, we have a mixture of gold and shit all mixed up. And for me, 
I was telling myself in my 20s and 30s and 40s about how bad the relationship had been all my life with my father. The first 10 years of my life, I had a great relationship with my father, but I had completely forgotten that. That had gone somewhere else. And by having these conversations, we can sort out the gold and get rid of some of the poisonous stuff. Really, we're talking about connection today. If we're deeply connected with our father, we can be connected with everybody. That's how I think it works. Why is it like this? Well, if you think about a boy, a day in a boy's life, he gets up in the morning, his dad is off to work, like I used to do. He's with his mother, he goes to school, nine out of ten teachers are women. He comes home at the end of the day, and his father might collapse on the sofa. So there's not time together for boys and their fathers. It didn't used to be like this. Before the Industrial Revolution, if we go back a couple of hundred years, for thousands of years, boys and fathers and grown guys used to go out hunting together, used to spend all of their time together. But that stopped with the Industrial Revolution. And what I think's happened is, naturally, there should be three phases to this relationship. One when they're young, one when their man becomes independent, he goes his own way, and then they come together again, they reunite. And it's this part that in our society seems to be missing. So what have I seen in the last 15 years as a leadership coach? Well, I've done a lot of one-to-one -one coaching, mostly with men. What have I seen over this period of time? Yeah, not many happy people go to work in big organizations. I'd say most people I've worked with are a bit like I used to be. Not perhaps as bad as I was, but certainly in that direction. And unfortunately, I've seen this. Maybe one of ten people I've coached says, hey, I've got a great relationship with my father. But not the rest of them. I want to see a world that looks like that. I want us to be aware and build awareness of what an important issue this is so that people can have those conversations. So that not one out of ten people's got a great relationship with dad, but maybe four out of ten. Can you imagine how the world would change if this could happen? That people felt complete, they felt connected. They could be great dads and fathers. And of course, I'm a leadership coach. There's a huge link here with leadership. I was a poor leader when I had a hole here. If we can find a way to make people feel complete and whole, we can have far better leadership in our organizations. And of course, this is vitally important for our kids, for my son. And I think that we've got to be the generation with internet, with TED Talks, with all of the things that we can do to change this and make the world a much better place. Thank you.